Wow. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I don't know if you guys realize this, but it's not always easy to get up here and do stuff. Thank you. So, sacred service is our topic today. And we're continuing our series on core values. I'm going to lean on the stool a little bit today because my feet are still not where they need to be. Although I got to say, wearing my Birkenstocks all the time is helping a lot. I may have to become a, go, go back to Birkenstocks 100% of the time. But anyway, so I'm going to enjoy the stool a little bit. So sacred service is our topic today. And Our definition for this community of sacred service is we generously serve and support one another and our community through love in action. That's, that's a part of who you are. That came up from the collective consciousness of this church. And I am honored to be a part of that. They call me, they, whoever they are, well, Reverend Stephanie at this point, they call me the sacred service minister. And I have to say that there are times that I just really chuckle at that in my heart because, and out loud, because I never thought of myself that way. Um, I never thought of myself that way. In the Bhagavad Gita, in uh, Hindu tradition, there are four paths, four basic paths to, um, to reach spirit or enlightenment or whatever you're calling it based on where you are in the moment. Uh, love and devotion is one. Meditation is one. Um, knowledge is one. The study, the intellectual study of God. And sacred service. And I always thought of myself as any of the other three. Oh, love and devotion. Oh, that's why I love Rumi so much. Um, intellectual study. Okay, I got books. Honey, I got some books, okay? Um, meditation, I love it. And I thought, okay, well, I don't need to deal with sacred service. I'll just be my own little monk in my own little closet until I ended up with a job a few years ago as the volunteer coordinator at, um, at Unity North, of course. So, and I gotta say, Lenore, one of the reasons I'm just in awe of you today is I look at the timeline and I think of the, um, the organizational structure to organize the volunteers to do what we're gonna do in that building, and I think, I am humbled. I am truly humbled. Um, which brings me to another point. I woke up this morning thinking I knew what I was going to talk about. I had read and written and had my outline and all these papers, and I'm going to tell you right now that I'm going to be shuffling through these papers at some points because I got on Facebook this morning just to do a quick check-in because I like to make sure that nobody's got any serious problems I need to know about or serious joys. I found out it was... Pat's birthday on Facebook. Yay, Yay thank you, Facebook. Um, happy birthday, Pat. But <laughs> Spirit managed to make a particular video show up in front of me. And it so humbled me that my whole talk is different this morning and completely off the cuff because of that video. So I'm going to tell you for a moment about a man named Narayanan Krishnan. All right? And um, this man uh, lives in Bangladesh, I believe. He is from the Brahmin order, uh, which is the highest class in uh, Hindu, the class system. They're the ministers. They're the minister families, OK? And he had a good job in 2002. He worked in a four-star hotel as a chef. And he went out on the street, and he saw someone in such need 
This, this person was so hungry that I won't share with you how hungry this person was. But he was so hungry that it moved Narayanan to quit his job and devote himself to feeding the hungry. And it's just a two minute, 30 second video, but it is so moving and it's so well put together that it, it just, it moved me so deeply. Now, the ego is a funny thing because the ego, my ego, immediately went to, oh, and you're gonna talk about sacred service. You're gonna go up there with all your fancy words and talk about sacred service when here is a man who is truly making a huge difference where he is. And fortunately, because of the work for the previous week in getting ready for the class I covered for Stephanie, I was very attuned to my meditation and I was, I've been practicing spiritual awareness because I had to teach about it, you know, and there's nothing like having to teach about something to really get you back on the ball. So I heard that voice inside me and I recognized it as my ego. And I began to remember the mantra that came to me this morning in my meditation. That mantra came to me this morning through a poem I read by Rumi. All of this stuff is connected, folks. It's all connected. Stay with me. Today, I am so honored and moved to be who I am that that is all that matters. Today, I am so moved and honored to be who I am that that is all that matters. So that mantra came back to me as I watched that video and the monkey mind started to tell me I am not qualified to kiss this man's feet. And, and I thought about all the things that I've put together to talk to you about today. And I realized there is a lot of power in not only these words, but there is a lot of power in you. And the truth is, is sometimes we get overwhelmed with what's going on out there in the world or in our own lives. We can become so overwhelmed that we become frozen, don't we? We think that whatever we do isn't good enough. Or I can't possibly quit my job. Or if you're like me, one of the little voices in my head said, how, how does quitting your job serve these people? But then I began to see how it did. The money just started to come to him. The donations for the food he cooks come to him. But we're not all called to quit our jobs and live on the streets in Bangladesh. We're not, called, we're not all called to quit our jobs and live on the streets in Atlanta. But we are all called to something. We are all called to something. And the only place that we will ever know what that something is, the only time that we will ever know what that something is, is in the present moment. And in the ability to practice letting all the noise fall away. Letting all the noise fall away. And that doesn't mean that you have perfect silence. It means that you allow the noise in your head to just calmly fade a little bit. So our hearts are actually wired to serve. I'll try not to cover up all of your notes here, Kathy, because I see that some of these are for you. So please forgive my post-it notes. Ah, sometimes it's a post-it no life, you know? So we are all called to give and to serve in some sort of way. We're wired for it. The heart longs to reach out and help. Being of service to one another actually makes us feel good. Likewise, we experience pain when we see suffering, and especially when we feel that there's nothing we can do to help. So part of the practice involved with all this is coming to that place inside 
where you can actually hear what it is for you to do to help. Just showing up is a big help. So our minds can often respond to the pain and the suffering of others with fear and will try to protect us in some way. Ram Dass and Paul Gorman write in How Can I Help? Denial, abstraction, pity, professional warmth, compulsive hyperactivity, been there. These are a few of the ways in which the mind reacts to suffering and attempts to restrict or direct the natural compassion of the heart. This tension between head and heart leaves us tentative and confused. As we reach out, then pull back, love and fear are pitted against one another. As hard as this is for us, what, might this, what must this be like for those who need our help? And so when I saw this man giving of himself in this video, I realized, you know, he wasn't tentative about what he was doing in the space he was creating. He's human, so there had to have been some of that noise. There had to be some of that monkey mind chatter going on. But he was able to relax into it and create a space that allowed him to serve where it needed to happen, where he needed to serve. And he wasn't just up against the kinds of things we think of in our streets. He was up against the, see, we kind of honor people who go and wash the feet of the poor and spoon feed people in need. We, we uplift that. But in his culture, he was looked down on, is looked down on for that activity because that's below him. That's below his class. And so not only is he serving the people whom he's feeding, but he is shifting a whole center of consciousness. It may not change completely in his lifetime, but I bet you that within a generation, people will look back and think, I can't believe that we were ever not allowed to touch you and help you and serve you. So what a huge thing that is. But I want to remind us that we're all you know, when, when, when he stepped out to serve, he wasn't thinking, I'm going to create a big, huge change in the world. He didn't think he was doing that. He was just feeding one person. He was just feeding the person in front of him. He was just doing what was in front of him. So... All the major religious, religions tell us that serving one another plays an important role on the path to God or enlightenment. In Judaism, it's referred to as tikkun olam, the, re, the repair of creation. Um, that chokes me up a little bit. I've got background in Kabbalah, and I love that idea. I also love the idea, and here we are with paradox, I love the idea that there's nothing that needs fixing. Can we serve from a place of wanting to repair creation and yet at the same time holding in our minds the realization that nothing needs fixing? That's paradox. And both are true. In Hinduism, service to the world around us is a part of the yoga of action, one of those four yogas I talked about a few moments ago. In Christianity, it's often referred to as charity, but is bound to the word love, and especially the word agape in Greek, or unconditional love. So that's tied to giving without attachment, giving without requiring an end result to show up in a particular way. Again, that's a paradox. We want to give and we want that person to be healed. I want to pray with somebody and I want to, I want, oh, pick up thy mat and walk, you know? Well, wouldn't that be awesome? But no, we pray or we give or we serve 
And then our job, our practice, is to let it go, to release it into the cosmos, to be whatever it's going to be. That's, that's the practice. That's part of the practice. There's a lot to the practice, but that's part of the practice. And in Islam, the teaching is that all blessings, including wealth, are gifts from God and are meant to be shared. They regard helping others to be a human and social duty. In Roots of Buddhism, in Roots of Buddhist Psychology, Jack Kornfield writes, we all have, without ex exception, a very deep longing to give, to give to the earth, to give to each other, to give to the society, to work, to love, to care for this earth. That's true for every human being, and even the ones who don't find it, it's because it has been squashed or somehow suppressed in some brutal way in their life but it's there to be discovered. We all long for that. So when I began to look at myself more honestly, I realized that I didn't really want to hide from service. I was hiding from myself. I was hiding from the idea that I actually could make a difference, that a small thing could make a difference, that simply praying with one person could make a difference, that simply smiling at one person could make a difference. Um, so this is where I skip around because I want to read a different thing in a different order. Uh, hmm. A small thing can make a difference. Macrina Wiederkern tells this story. One special moment of beauty that stands out in my mind I experienced in a bus station. I witnessed a little girl helping her brother get a drink at the water fountain. Attempting to lift him to the proper height turned out to be impossible. I was just at the point of giving them some assistance when quick as lightning she darted over to a shoeshine man, pointed to a footstool he wasn't using, dragged it to the water fountain, and very gently lifted her thirsty brother up for a drink. It all happened so fast, and it was so simple, yet it turned out to be a moment of beauty that became a prayer for me. So much to be learned from such a simple little moment. Perhaps what touched me most was her readiness to seek out a way to take care of the need without waiting to be rescued. It was a moment of beauty, a small child with a single heart. Sometimes it's not a big giant thing. We get the big giant things on Facebook and I'll tell you, we get the big giant things on Oprah because I'm just loving what Oprah's doing these days. I'm gonna tell you about it real briefly. Or maybe not briefly, I don't know, we'll see. She's doing um, life class is what she's calling it. And it was on every night last week. And this woman is such the epitome of service. Now, we may look at it from one point of view and say, wow, she's got a big fancy TV show and she does this and she does that and all of that stuff. But I've been watching very carefully as her last season wound down because for years I didn't watch her. I was, I was too busy to watch Oprah. And when, she, when her when season was winding down, I started to pay attention. And I started to watch her in that place of awareness, in that place of being connected to spirit. And I watched the fact that she really gives of herself in this work. It's not about the TV show for her. It's about touching people. And so anyway, Friday night, you know, I, I was almost all prepared again. I thought I was all ready for my talk. And I watched Friday night's episode. And Friday night's episode was about um, it was about joy rising. That's the name of the talk her point that she was making, joy rising. And it started out 
with her reviewing how they did the great car giveaway a few years ago. I didn't see it when it was on because I had a job and we didn't have a VCR or whatever. So, but they gave away cars and they, but they set it up in such a way as to increase joy in the people. They didn't just give people cars, they set the whole thing up to, they call, they, first of all, they handpicked people who needed cars to be in the audience. They put a tremendous amount of work in this. Now we think, oh, we'll just throw, a, throw 300 people in the room and surely people are going to need cars. No, they handpicked people who really needed cars to be in that room. And they all thought they were there for different reasons. They had no idea they were there for what they were there for. And so then she calls up 11 people up on the stage to get their cars. You get a car, you get a car, you get a car. And we watch as they're reviewing this and showing it on the screen, the faces of the people in the audience who were not being called to get a car. Now they all needed cars, but what we see is that they all, they all are experiencing joy for the people who have received the cars. At the end, they thought these are the only 11 people getting cars and they were ecstatic for the people up on the stage getting the cars. Now, not only that, but I am watching in my living room and I am ecstatic. And because I was practicing getting ready for the class I taught on Thursday, I was noticing how ecstatic I was and feeling the joy and thinking, wow, this is the mirror that we're taught about in the teachings and how it looks with joy. It's easy to see the mirror when it's somebody pointing out your bad spots. But this was joy rising. Now, then, guess what? Everybody in the audience ends up getting a car. And they're all just, I mean, they had medics on the property because they were afraid somebody was going to have a heart attack. I almost had a heart attack watching the thing in my living room. It was, and this happened years ago. So. This is phenomenal. The ability of the human being to experience joy through seeing someone else served. Do you get that? So when you hand somebody a bagel or a Danish or a piece of fruit, let's go with a piece of fruit. When you hand somebody a piece of fruit, they are being served. When you rip out the carpeting in the building next door, they are being served. You are serving people that you may never see, but just know it in your mind. And when you do have the opportunity to see who you're serving, let yourself receive the joy from that. It's huge because that's part of what keeps it all going. That's what keeps the joy going. Receiving it and then giving it back. You, when you have the opportunity to be served, receive it. Let somebody serve you. Um, Rachel Remen tells a story in Kitchen Table Wisdom. She tells a story of a young man who we'll call Jeff. And before his diagnosis of osteogenic sarcoma, he had been a high school and college athlete, nice cars, um, pretty girls, popularity were all a part of his life. But two weeks after his diagnosis, his right leg had to be removed. And while the surgery ended up being life-saving, in his mind, his life had ended. Jeff became very angry and bitter. He started taking drugs, drinking heavily, and soon he alienated himself from his old friends and associates. As a result of these things, he was referred by a former coach to Dr. Raymond. In their first session, it became clear that Jeff harbored a great deal of resentment toward doctors and especially toward healthy people. To encourage openness, Dr. Riemann invited him to draw a picture of his body. He, produced, he proceeded to angrily draw a vase with a large black crack down the middle, ripping the paper as he drew. When Jeff left, Dr. Raymond kept it, thinking it was too important to throw away. On later visits, Jeff started bringing newspaper clippings of people who had been permanently deformed in accidents. He was still very angry, 
But the doctor saw him coming, slowly coming out of himself and becoming concerned with other people's welfare. Soon he began going to visit patients in the surgical wards whose problems were like his, and he found that he had great success connecting with many of these individuals, even when others couldn't. Doctors started asking him to come and visit specific patients because of the positive influence he had on them. It became a sort of a ministry for him. One day he went to visit a young woman of 21 years who, as a pre preventative measure, had had both breasts removed because of a family history with breast cancer. In spite of great attempts to cheer her, the young woman was so depressed that she wouldn't even look up at him. Finally, in desperation, Jeff tore his artificial leg off and let it drop to the floor with a thud. Startled, she looked up and he started hopping around the room, snapping his fingers to some music, laughing as he did so. After a while, she burst out in laughter as well. She said, fella, if you can dance, maybe I can sing. Sometime later, they started visiting people together and they were eventually married. In Jeff's final meeting with Dr. Raymond, she drew out the picture of the cracked vase he'd drawn over two years before. After studying it for some time, he said, you know, it's really not finished. And then with a crayon in hand, Jeff started to draw bright yellow lines bursting from the crack. Dr. Raymond watched the smiling man somewhat puzzled. When Jeff finished, he looked up and said, this is where the light comes through. There is no doubt that the work of this young man changed the people he served. The doctors were asking for him to come and visit their patients, but the work also deeply changed him and the way he looked at life. So we all have cracks in our vase somewhere. We all feel somewhere inside a calling to serve in some way. It doesn't have to be in a big, huge way like Oprah. She touched so many people just in that one episode. Um, and, and, and it's very moving. And the guy on the video is touching many, many people in a huge way. But none of them started out big, huge. And so what I want to invite you to do is don't be afraid of big, huge, and keep from serving in little, small. You know, don't let a fear of big, huge keep you from serving in whatever way you can. Sometimes just a word here or there makes a big difference. There are times when, when one of you will come up and say something to me, you'll, you'll say something particularly nice to me, you may not realize that spirit moves you in those moments. Because many times, it's just the thing Stephanie or I or Debbie needs to hear in that moment to uplift us. to remind us that what we do actually does make a difference. What you do actually does make a difference. So I'm going to skip through all of this fun stuff I thought was so important. Oh, this I am going to share. I've got two more things I'm going to share. This is important. Wayne Muller, in his book, Legacy of the Heart, offers this story about Gandhi. Because remember, I'm always going to come back to some kind of spiritual practice, right? It's in that, okay? So the practice of loving kindness must find its roots deep within us. The story is told that Mohandas Gandhi once settled in a village and at once began serving the needs of the villagers who lived there. A friend inquired if Gandhi's objectives in serving the poor were purely humanitarian. And Gandhi replied, not at all. I am here to serve no one but myself, to find my own self-realization through the service of these village folk. As Gandhi wisely points out, even as we serve others, we are working on ourselves. Every act, every word, Every gesture of genuine compassion naturally nourishes our own hearts as well. 
It is not a question of who is healed first. When we attend to ourselves with compassion and mercy, more healing is made available to others. And when we serve others with an open and generous heart, great healing comes to us. So whether you're serving in the building, helping to renovate, whether you're helping in the kitchen here, washing dishes, which is hugely important, whether you're sitting with people in hospice or taking care of AIDS patients or just bathing your child or sharing a word with someone, it's a huge, important difference. And you are working on yourself. And so last but not least, because I can't leave this out, you'll see why in a moment, um, I want to share with you a quote from Andrew Harvey. Does that name sound familiar? Andrew Harvey. <laughs> so I found this, and it's from his book called The Way of Passion. And it ties not only to Andrew Harvey and Rumi, but it also ties to the class from Thursday night in spiritual practice. One day, Rumi asked one of his young, snotty disciples to give him an enormous amount of rich and delicious food. This young disciple was rather alarmed because he thought Rumi was living an ascetic lifestyle. Rumi used to pray all night and eat hardly anything. The disciple thought, aha, now I've really got the master. What he really wants is to go off somewhere and secretly eat all this food. So he decided to follow Rumi. He followed him through the streets of Konya, out into the fields, out into yet other further fields. Then he saw Rumi go into a ruined tomb. I'm finally going to unmask his pretensions, the young disciple thought. But what he found was a totally exhausted dog with her six puppies. And Rumi was feeding the dog with his own hands so that she could survive to feed her children. Rumi knew that the disciple was following him, of course, and he turned to him smiling and said, See? The disciple, extremely moved and humbled, said, But how on earth did you know that she was here? How did you know that she was hungry? This is miles away from where you are. Rumi laughed and laughed. When you have become awake, your ears are so acute that you can hear the cries of a sparrow 10,000 miles away. And so as we move into our meditation time, I invite you to contemplate the practice of deep hearing the practice that leads us to a place of hearing what is needed. What is mine to do today? <laughs> 